Um, this is a talk on ideology nationalism and identity. I don't usually work on multi-party systems in Europe. I've done a little bit of work on the legislative side. This is my first foray into the, the more political or electoral side of the question. Um, when I was uh, five years ago, uh, I was in Boise, Idaho. And Boise, Idaho, has a, every five years, has a festival called Hayaldi. And Hayaldi is the big party, basically. And every, so Hayaldi is this enormous Basque party where people from all over the world, from Argentina come, from this, the Basque provinces come, and all over the western United States. And it's all these Basques getting together traditional games, traditional dances, traditional music. Um, the, the traditional games are very agrarian. They consist of you know, large men lifting granite balls repeatedly. Um, uh, younger, more muscular men with uh, ten, wearing tennis shoes hopping on logs with very sharp axes and racing through five logs to see who can cut through these logs without chopping their feet. Um, and it's, it's a fantastic time. And of course, at the end of the evening, every evening, we all retire to the bar and try to stay up as late as we can. And in Boise, Idaho, the bar is usually closed at 11, so you know, 1 o'clock in the morning is quite unusual. And the bars were completely packed with Spaniards. There were, no, there were no Americans left except for a couple of us. And at the bars were all the people from the different factions in the Basque regional government. And Pachi Lopez was there. Um, and, but it was fascinating that no one would talk to Pachi Lopez. Pachi Lopez was the socialist president of the Basque Regional Authority. And all of the Americans were horrified because Pachi Lopez is a socialist, and that was you know, the worst thing you could be in the United States. And all the Basques were horrified because Pachi Lopez does not speak the language. And therein is our lesson. You know, here you can figure out the lesson of the story as we go. The Basque uh, parliamentary elections are fascinating for a number of reasons. One of them, one of them is that, as you, what you can see graphically from the table is there are a few parties, the PND, the PSE, and the PP, who are routinely receiving seats in the Basque government. And if you look closely at table one in the paper, they're receiving approximately the same share of seats every year. So it's very stable among the, the three biggest parties, going to, back to Nick's uh, portrayal. And then you see over here, there are a bunch of parties that are just coming in and out of the political system. Um, and it's kind of crazy. Year to year, it's a different set of parties. Um, and there's one party column that we, you know, we crammed a bunch of parties into one column. Because this party column, this is fascinating to study, this party keeps getting banned by the Spanish civil court. Um, and they get banned because they run uh, people who have histories of terrorism, or, um, or they, they're funded by ETA. And so the, the Spanish civil court will ban the entire slate. Uh, in fact, the very first election in the region in 1980, this party won 11 seats out of 65, and none of those seats were allowed. So it has big effects on the, on the political alignment. The party came back in a, a new form called Bildu. It's an interesting coalition. We talk about coalitions of parties within parties and party reformation. Um, and variously, we've had the communists coming in and out, the greens coming in and out. Um, this party, which we'll talk about as well. And then we have another phenomenon of wasted votes, uh, where sometimes party voters will go in and waste an enormous number of votes. The most interesting phenomenon was in 2009, when 9% of people, people who voted in the Basque country, went in, spoiled their ballot, and voted it. Um, they were protesting the Spanish civil court banning the um, terrorist parties. The other phenomenon, going back to Nick's talk, um, is we have a fairly, we have one party that is, except for three years, always in government, always running the government. It's the Basque National Party, the PNV. Um, and we've had four presidents up until the present president. So it's really a very few number of parties, a very few number of people who are running the government in the region. We've had we had uh, uh, six years of stable minority government. Um, we we're back in minority government. We've had coalitions throughout. And it's always the PNV that um, gets returned, except for this one event 
uh, in 2009 when the PSOE formed a coalition with the PP. So anybody who knows anything about Spanish politics, the PSOE is the socialists, and the PP is the far right, which kind of was, was reformed from allies of Franco and, and Catholic Church supporters. So these are two parties that never coalesced <coughs> in Spanish federal elections in the general court, but here they are coalescing in the regional politics. So the regional politics are producing very strange political alliances. Um, and this is where, these are just some basic facts for which our, this, part, this talk starts. So I have a couple of questions I'm interested in, in understanding. Uh, the, the main one is, why are regional nationalist parties successful? What, what is the political underpinning of them? And uh, in thinking about this, in reflecting on this question, um, I keep coming back to something that Gary Cox did a while ago when he was studying um, the number of parties in different party systems and trying to explain different phenomena. And he had an interesting explanation from in, for, for India, which was in India, there are 16 or so parties in the national government, but every Indian state has a stable two-party system. And the national government is just a, an aggregation or accumulation of those multiple stable two-party systems. So one question coming out of Gary's work is, well, do other regional governments have that flavor? The answer is clearly no. You have, in fact, more party systems, and the question there would be why. The other question that I've, where the Socorro and I are chipping away at here, is why does a system that appears so unstable, with parties coming and going, appear to have such stable governmental politics, where the PNV is repeatedly returned? Why is it that the regional nationalist party is able to dominate the government? And there are different explanations for why the nationalist parties are so successful in this region. One of them is ideology. Maybe the regional nationalist parties are perfectly positioned so that they are capturing the right share of the vote. Maybe they're capturing the median. Um, sort of, that would be one uh, possible explanation that Mick had just mentioned. So ideology is one possibility, and we've got a kind of left-right spectrum in the legislature, and perhaps the PNV is the right. The other possibility is another dimension to politics that shows up in regional um, elections, and that's autonomy. Um, and it's true even in the United States. So in the United States, we often talk here talk of states' rights versus federal rights, and that, that often takes the flavor of some attempt by the state government to assert greater autonomy or separatism in the administration of the law so that the local political forces can dictate public policy the way they want. Uh, in, the Bas in the Spanish Constitution, the regional governments are provisionally given autonomy. And they set up, Spanish Constitution set up autonomous communities. The Basque uh, community is one of them. The Catalan, Catalonia is another autonomous community. The Spanish civil court's been moving around what autonomy means, and that's a source of great controversy here, as I've been learning more about since visiting. Um, the Basques have have varied in the degree to which they want autonomy. The Pepe and the Pesoe want the Basque regional authority to be completely within the Spanish federal system and pretty much govern centrally. The PNV, which is the party that's mainly been running the Basque uh, region, wants a great deal of autonomy, possibly independence. And then the party that continually gets banned, whatever form it is, like it's uh, HB or EH or now Bildu wants complete independence. So there's a continuum of policies one can pursue that would be considered autonomy. And then finally, identity. So maybe people just vote for these nationalist parties because they're the best speakers, right? This is the Pachi Lopez story. Um, that they represent the culture, the language, and all the other markers that go along with with that culture. So this is an attempt to model and think systematically about voting behavior in the region, try to figure out what's driving voting behavior, so what's undergird, what, what electoral behavior undergirds the political alignments that we see. And uh, we really started by listening, or at least I started, I think Socorro as well, started by just hearing what other people say. I have a number of friends who are involved in Basque political parties um, in the Spanish side, 
and they give us various accounts about which part, and they can figure out for me what parties are collect is the right and who's who and so forth. And listening to what they say, there's a simple representation, at least the way people talk and think about politics in the region, in terms of two dimensions. So we have a two-dimensional spatial um, politics. There's traditional left-right ideology that we might see in Spanish national government, France, or any other European system. But then there's this nationalism question, which is how much autonomy. Now, this is not a great beginning for any kind of attempt to come up with an equilibrium policy or equilibrium government, because when you have multiple dimensions, you tend not to have very um, good predictive power from modeling. Uh, second possibility is there's just valence, which is government performance. Maybe what's going on is the PNB is so good at running the government and producing economic growth that people just keep rewarding it and keeping it in power. And in fact, the Basque region is um, perhaps the most economically successful of all the regions in, in Spain. It's, currently, its unemployment rate is 10%, which is like unheard of in the, in the country. Uh, and then finally, identity, cultural identification. Um, which of these parties is the Basque Party? Am I going to vote for the Basque Party simply because they happen to speak the language, or they happen to take the side in, during the ETA uprising that I liked, or they happen to take the, their grandparents happen to take the side in the Spanish Civil War? Or perhaps I really don't like the PP because I associate that with Frank. End of story, I will never vote for the PP for that reason. And it's just these old hatreds that are driving politics. The model, just to go through it graphically as opposed to algebraically, consists of two dimensions, ideology and nationalism, and will allow for there to be differential degrees of salience. In fact, one of the questions we want to ask, and ultimately get to, is whether or not what's driving this is common folkism that I hear from my colleagues in the, in the Basque country, that nationalism is in fact a more salient issue than ideology. And the reason that politics look the way they do in the region is because nationalism is more salient. Now more salient in this context, in the spatial context, means that the, the elliptical contours are actually tighter in the national, nationalist direction than in the it's also possible that ideology and nationalism are correlated. I fool around with the data. It doesn't look like there's much of that, and there's particular reasons for that. Um, politically, like the nationalists, are, the Basques are extremely Catholic. They're very Catholic. They're perhaps the most Catholic part of uh, them. The Poles are the most Catholic part of, of, um, of Spain. So that kind of makes them, you know, a bunch of them more to the right over here on ideology. But they're also they were also quite radicalized during the Spanish Civil War because the communists from Russia, the ones who supplied the guns, because the Americans and the Brits stayed out. Um, and so the, the, they run the ideological spectrum in, in nationalism. So, so if you take a, a level of nationalism, you get quite a range of different views. And as a result, there doesn't seem to be much of a correlation between ideology and nationalism within the country. Um, so we're going to imagine, we're going to ignore this, this side, we're going to imagine you have two parties, party J and party K, and there's a set of voters who are just indifferent between the two parties. If I had a correlated issue, that indifference line might be tilted one way or the other, depending on the nature of the correlation. So any voter here, so I'm just taking quadratic utility, just spherical utilities in this case, any voter here is going to be indifferent between party J and party K, any voter over here will be indifferent between J and K, anybody up here will vote for K, anybody down here will vote for J. Uh, valence simply shifts that indifference curve, so in this case the valence shock, say to the good economy, would benefit party K, so all these voters, their indifference, the point of indifference, the hyperplane of indifference, indifference shifts this way, so all these voters vote for K. And identity is added as a constant term for an individual associated with the party, and some individuals might actually be pulled to the Basque side, or some might be pulled to the Spanish side. So we have to think about the net shift. So some people are going to be having had their, their indifference curve or their indifference point shift one way and some another way. So we're going to imagine this line moving each way. If you are an Ushkera identifier, so you, you, you care about the language, that's it. And this is the Ushkera party, so anybody over here who's in, is going to be shifted that direction. So this is if you get a valence shock. So 
the identity politics treated as a kind of individual specific valence shock or a group specific valence shock. If you're a Spanish identifier, you might have your valence moved in that direction. So this is going to create a kind of window of people who where some are moved that way, some are moved that way. So it, look, it's, it's, it actually looks a little like probabilistic voting, uh, but it's it's not. It's just sort of variable valence shocks across the different groups. In uh, three parties, we're going to have a lot of parties in this space. So just to get you thinking about the, how the parties divide the space, imagine there's three parties, I, J, and K. They're going to divide the space that way. So anybody up here is going to be a K voter. Anybody down here is a J voter. Anybody over here is an I voter. If you're in group E and K is the E group favored party, then that's going to shift the entire set of cut lines that way. If you're in group S and party J is the S preferred party, it's going to shift it that way. So you get this whole region in here of kind of ambiguity. You need to know, if you're just thinking spatially, there's going to be this whole region where you're ambiguous because the valence shocks associated with the identity are going to be moving some of these voters this way and some of these voters that way. So that summarizes where we are. We're going to look for the space of ideology crossed with nationalism. We're going, to, we, we're going to need to know where the parties are located in this space and which voters are um, pro-Spanish, which voters are pro-Basque, and also whether there are any valence shocks um, year to year in the regional elections. So to address this model, to try to estimate all the components of it, we turn to data from the CIS, the, the, so, the Sociology Center in Madrid, and they regularly collect um, data on Spanish elections, not just this region, but every region all the way back to 1974, I think was the first survey that they run. There are some other surveys out there, but we didn't ransack those yet, and there, there are other regions that we haven't looked at as well. So first, we wanted to just get a perceptual picture of where the parties are and where the voters are. And the survey asks, on a 1 to 10 scale, where do you place yourself from left to right? And on a 1 to 10 scale, where do you place yourself in terms of more, auto more autonomy or less autonomy for the, for the region? Um, they don't anchor the scale. We can debate what the meaning of the scales is. We're just taking these at face value that people are using these scales in a sensible way. And we've divided the space into quadrants just to aggregate the data up and we've aggregated all the data from 1994 to the present. So 5% of the people are up here. That is, they're nationalist and they're conservative. 17% of the people are up here. That is, they're nationalist and they're socialist. 7% of the people are down here. 5% of the people are down here. 3% here. 20% are here. 22% are here. Okay, so most, you know, the, there's a mode in the middle. There's another kind of hump over here, and then it's much thinner over here. The parties, the survey asks, where do you place the parties in each of these dimensions? So we've aggregated those placements over time. Um, the PNB is right here. Okay, so they're kind of center right, but nationalist. EH, HB, Bildu, whatever, that party that keeps getting banned is right here. Far to the left, in fact, the farthest to the left, and the most nationalist. The PP is down here. This is the national, the, the federal, that is the Spanish level um, conservative party. They're very much opposed to autonomy, and they're far to the right. The PSC is here. Right? So the PSC is actually, in terms of the ideology of the country, it's right on the median in the left-right dimension in, in, in the region. But it is far from the median here. The median's about here on nationalism, and it's far from the median there. Um, then we have some scattered third parties that I'll highlight. There's this party, the UPYD, which is a kind of rightist-leaning party. It does very well in one province within the region. Um, and it coalesces with the PP a lot of the time. It's not clear how independent it is. EU is also the Green Party now, so that's over here. Notice it's kind of moderate on nationalism, but it is pretty far left. And then there's this very interesting party, EA, which split from the PNB uh, in 1980. 
uh, 86, 86 and has progressively lost power. It's very interesting what happened to this party over time. So I would have guessed that this party would have kind of become a dominant party. Um, it's very similar to the Catalan party uh, in a similar location, but it's, it just got weaker and weaker and weaker. And as it got weaker, it actually moved. You can see it moving over time this way. And now it's become folded into this, this party. So then we overlaid where we thought the cut lines would be. That is, if we just took the cut line, forgot about identity and valence politics, and forgot about salience, so imagine all the utilities were spherical, find the cut lines. So here's where all the cut lines would be. And we can imagine the PNV, say, capturing all these voters, they are catch, capturing these, EH and Bildu capturing these, EU should have been in a great position. Um, PSC kind of squeezed in here. UPYE, pretty good. PP, pretty good. But keep in mind, this is not a high percentage of the population over here. And there's no party in here, so it's a big fight over the center. Um, and then we just imagine overlaying this and, and asking the question does the spatial representation make any sense? So, is the PNV winning most of the votes here and very little anywhere else? In fact, is it winning zero down here? Is PP winning most, most of these votes and getting nothing over here? But that's what you'd expect if there wasn't any craziness going on. And fortunately, it's good news, everybody, the Basques are not as crazy as you think. <laughs> so the PNV gets 90% of these voters, and they get 86% of these voters. So the PNV really is able to prey on the AI voters. And they're, they're, they basically drive AI out of business. And it's an interesting question how, I'm not sure quite how, how it is. They do pretty well over here. This 31% is a little bit un, uh, misleading because they're capturing votes when that party gets banned. So, And they get only 5% of votes down here. So they're not doing very well over here. They get half the votes in the center, so they seem to be overperforming in here. Um, they're not, they get some votes down here and over here. If I take another party, the PSC, gets 55% of the votes down here, gets a quarter of the votes in here, so it doesn't, it look, doesn't look so bad. They do extremely well here. I think this is really good evidence of strategic voting because there's no sense in which he who would ever be um, a player, and it, it, it isn't when you look at the, like, the minimum, minimum integer voting weights and so forth. It's, sometimes it's a dummy in the coalition formation games and so forth. Uh, PP, this is good. They're getting 67% of the votes down here, about 20% in here, about half the votes in here. They don't get any votes over here. We like that. That's a good prediction. Right? They shouldn't get any votes over there. They're not well liked. EH, Bildu is underperforming, but that's partly because they're banned for part of those elections. If you throw out the elections in which they're banned, they get two-thirds of the vote up there, and they're competing against PNV and a little bit EU. So what I'd like to do is somehow make an assessment of the importance of the issues, the relevance of identity, because one of the things that could be going on in that central region is identity politics, right? Those are the people who should be getting pushed one way or the other. Um, and uh, also whether it's valence, people just like the job and the competence of the PNV over the other parties. Because the PNV does seem to be overperforming in places where we didn't expect it to. So the idea is uh, you start with a simple random utility model. Those are quadratic utilities. You can do some math, it's done in the paper very quickly, and find that you can represent the probability that you vote for party J over party A. We're going to leave the PNV as party A throughout. Any other party over the PNV, as, as just a linear function of the voters' preference on issue X, say that's left right, and the voters' preference on nationalism, issue Y. And, and it's linear. That's the nice thing about quadratics. I think that's what the functional form is giving us. It's a nice representation where there's going to be uh, a valence term, a term that will, that's going to be the identity associated with that party. So we're going to use the Spanish speaking versus Basque speaking to capture that. There are other variables we could use. Then there's going to be a beta for each party J that's being compared against A and each party C, uh, each party for, for uh, issue Y, C. 
So if you just start with the quadratic utility function and then multiply through the squares, collect some terms, and what you'll find is that the coefficients, the, the x term and the y term can be separated. That is, the individual's ideological point on x and on y can be separated, and there's a constant term in front, which is the, the true salience of that issue and the underlying utility model, times the difference between the two parties. Right? And let me come back to that in a clearer slide, which is that the beta j's and the cj's, the bj's and the cj's equal the true salience of the issue in the voter's mind. That's what I want to know. How salient is this issue? B and C times two times the difference between the parties on that issue. So if the parties are far apart and I run a regression, I'm going to get a huge salience term, even if the true salience is small. If the parties are close together, I'm going to get a tiny salience term just because the parties were close. And so long as the parties aren't completely converged, then I get zero. I can say something about B and C, so long as I have the estimates of where the parties are on those spaces. So since we wrote this paper, we've been sent about five or six other papers that have run similar regressions and regional analyses. As far as we can tell, none of them have, have noticed this aspect of the quadratic utility functions or utility functions. That is, in all the literature on this issue salience and political psychology, Everybody in the United States, everybody in Europe is missing the point. That that's an, the BJ is not a salience measure. B is a salience, and you're conflating the, the discriminability between the two parties with the actual salience of the issue. And we want to uncover the salience of the issue. So for every year, there's another table. For every year, we, we do a, whoa, come back. We do a multinomial logit. Um, you could do a multivariate probit. Results turn out to be about the same. You have to make some identifying conditions on the on the correlation structure. But. So here's the regression. Here's the piece that compares the PSC to the PNB. Um, here's the coefficient on nationalism. Here's the coefficient on left, right. Here's the coefficient on the economy. Here's the coefficient on being a Basque speaker. Being a Basque speaker, huge coefficient, about one. Economy, about, hang on, economy, about zero. These are just coefficients. So I'm these are the underlying parameters I'm trying to extract. They're not in terms of probabilities or anything yet. These are the underlying parameters from the probit or the logit for PSC versus PNB. So I could not interpret this. Here's one reason I cannot interpret this coefficient on nationalism as a salience, because it's negative. What does negative salience mean? Right? That, that would be a disallowed coefficient in a quadratic utility. Like, what? Makes no sense. Uh, and yet, it's, I, I've read papers just this week. People have sent me papers with negative valence, negative salience terms. Like, I don't know what these coefficients mean um, yet. So the economy, the economic performance never shows up or rarely shows up as significant. Like, they're not voting on the economy. They are voting on language. Huge fact. Um, so if I take this coefficient and I use the average party placements and I go through and divide by the average party placements, I end up with, I end up extracting almost identical numbers from PSC versus PNV, PP versus PNV, Bilbo versus PNV, etc. In other words, once you correct for the discriminability between the parties, you end up recovering almost exactly the same number in terms of the underlying salience. And the salience is such that nationalism is only about half as important or half as salient in people's thinking as the left-right dimension in these regional elections. So they're not voting on nationalism as much as they're voting on the left-right question. So we do this throughout, and we find that actually it's been very stable in the Basque country too. People's sense of ideology mattering and, say, and, and nationalism mattering has not changed since the 1990s. It's been very stable, even though the parties are moving around and so forth. Even though the parties, there seems to be a lot of party chaos in the, in the region, there's a lot of discussion of that. It does not seem to be a chaotic electorate. The salience hasn't changed, the positions of the parties haven't changed, the rough positions of the electorate haven't changed. The median's been very stable throughout the entire era. Um, and Ushkara speakers tend to have, give these nationalist parties a big boost. The one thing that does happen, if you look closely at the coefficients, is these are negative, here and here and here, which means that the PNB is favored by Ushkara speakers over the PSE or the PP or the EU. 
But this is positive, which means that with scatter speakers, everything else constant, favor B group, BH, HP. So a couple of implications. First about the voters, left, right has double the salience I'm at the end, so five minutes is good. Left, right has double the salience as nationalism. This is very surprising to people who are in the region. I don't think I'm gonna make any friends in the PNB with this, but I don't think I'll lose any because they won't be able to read the paper. Um, <laughs> There's a very large effect of identity. It's correlated about 0.4 in these data um, with the particular variable used, um, which means you really need to go to multivariate regression to start to make sense of this. Um, and it's big enough that it's, it explains much of the movement. It doesn't explain all of the misclassified voters, but it explains much of the misclassified voters, especially as we saw with AI. Like, why did AI get Beaten. Go back to those earlier regressions. AI was somehow not capturing new scatter speakers. That's what they were losing. And there's very little evidence of valence voting. Implications for parties. This is something we're still thinking through. Um, one is that there are really four parts to the party alignment in the region. First is the positions of the parties. There's a lot of party differentiation. They're more differentiated on the nationalism spectrum. There's a more steady array of them across the left-right dimension. Uh, the salience of issues. The variability in voters' preferences, there's a lot of, the, the, on the left-right issue, the Basque electorate is very centrist. Most of the voters are in that middle category, if we were just to look at one dimension at a time. On the autonomy dimension, the nationalism dimension, the voters are much more uniformly distributed, so they're more polarized on the nationalism, or not even polarized, it's an abusive term, they're more spread out. And as a result, I think that distribution of voter preferences is pulling people around. Um, so nationalism ends up being more divisive simply because of the distribution of where the voters are. Right? The variance of X is bigger, or variance of Y is bigger than the variance of X. So it ends up having a, in terms of the party system, has ended up pulling the parties apart more, creating incentive for more divergence, going back to kind of Gary's way of thinking about party systems um, in his absence. Uh, and so even though voters care less about it, the nationalism issue ends up having a bigger pull on the parties in the end. Implication for governments, big question is whether identity is creating the stability here. Is it the fact that all those centrist voters, are because they care about the language, are getting pulled to the PNB even though they're not supported otherwise? And is that why we're seeing the PNB kind of ending up routinely um, more popular? It shifts the PNB it's just the center toward the PNB and toward, and also toward EH and HB. And as a result, it's very hard for the PSE and the PP to attract those marginal voters, those voters in the middle, because they're getting pulled for language politics reasons out of there. I think my, my gut feeling is this creates identity, uh, the identity politics creates this kind of situation of minority rule. And Mick and I were talking about something related to this. And that is, identity cr creates an additional incentive for the parties not to make a deal. Don't contaminate your identity by making a deal with the PP if you're the PNC, or the PSC if you're the EHHP. Don't contaminate it. And as a result, that means that there, there's a smaller set of feasible coalitions to strike deals with, and it's harder also to strike deals between the left and the right because that's a more salient issue. So the voters are more likely to punish, so it's harder for the PNB and the EHHP to strike a deal, and that might be what's sustaining this minority rule of the PNB. So ultimately we'd like to nest this approach, the next step, in Dearmeyer and Marlowe's model of bargaining or anything else someone suggests.